Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. And it's my pleasure to introduce myself and say a few words about the course um, that I usually uh, present during this time of year. So um, I first start with uh, what I'm doing and when I'm not teaching this course, and hopefully um, we will have a chance to meet in person next year. Uh, I'm usually teaching this course in the summer and during the semester I'm teaching at the New York University uh, a course dealing with environmental social movements. When I'm not teaching, which is most of the time, I am working for a think tank called Climate Analytics and this is a think tank which is focusing on obviously climate as the name could indicate. I am myself focusing on energy and climate and it is a fascinating thing to focus on currently, keeping in mind how much is changing, how much is happening in this area currently. That also allows me to connect my different uh, focuses uh, when teaching, for example, the impact of social movements on the driving this change forward, starting with uh, 2019, especially with the Fridays for, uh, for Future movement, uh, we see a transformative change kicking in, not really happening yet, but there is quite some potential for it accelerating the change um, in the right direction. But again, there is a lot to do to keep it going and to move to accelerate the change. I am originally from Poland and hopefully there are some Polish people joining as well, but uh, uh, that explains the name um, and Andrzej and Sigurd and um, which is quite difficult to spell. I came to Berlin 2004 and this is a warning to you. Uh, be careful. If you come to Berlin, you may get stuck here as I have and uh, you may even love it as I do uh, because that's, well, at least for me, the place to be. Um, I spent uh, the last 12 years in Berlin most of the time because I went to Brussels. Uh, in the meantime, I went to Ireland uh, for two years as well. Um, I did internship for the European Commission in Brussels in 2009-2010, which allowed me to look, uh, to observe how the policy making uh, process functions uh, there. I was not able to contribute to the policy making process myself as just doing the internship back then, um, but uh, it was a very good experience, which I am hoping to share with you as well, if you, if you happen to be in Berlin. I have I started teaching for FUBIS uh, quite a while ago, uh, 2012, I think. And uh, it's always a very interesting experience every summer. Uh, first of all, because it's summer. And uh, secondly, whenever we have a new group of people coming over to Berlin, we have uh, a movie describing what the previous group of students was doing in Berlin. And um, it is as exciting to see that many of them experienced more over these two or three weeks in Berlin than I have over the last, well, many, many years. Um, so it is a very intensive, it is a very intensive time uh, and unforgettable for most of you probably as well. I encourage you to get the feeling uh, what FUBIS is all about on FUBIS website. There is a very interesting movie describing um, FUBIS program and uh, there's also just much, much more that cannot be summarized in, uh, in a five minutes long movie. The course, in a nutshell, what is all about. Uh, so it's obviously offered on site in Berlin. You get four ECTS points for attending it and passing it as well. That's an important aspect as well. Uh, you know, there's uh, also an important thing I have to keep in mind, or you have to keep in mind, you're not going for holiday, you will have a lot of fascinating experiences, but you also have to learn and study uh, while you're in Berlin. So these four ECTS points are not for free. During the course, we are focusing on identifying and discussing the solutions to current and future carbon problems by dividing them. Obviously, there are so many different challenges and issues uh, facing the humanity. And now with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a one more uh, that we would so much be better without but it's here and um, you're going to stay here for a while. So um, there are many numerous issues that we should be covering in this course, but we are not covering all of them. Uh, we have um, eight days uh, during which we discuss this uh, topics, these issues. Uh, so we have to be 
picky about them. I did select some of them. I will mention this in a second, but uh, it's also your choice. Uh, if you if you're coming with something very interesting, you would like to cover it. You would like to present about it. I'm more than happy to give you the stage for that. Um, so in general, we do divide um, the challenges into economic, political, and environmental issues. And uh, we're also trying to find out how can we solve some of those issues in existing framework. So what we are not doing is to come up with some solutions which just are not possible to implement in the current framework. Obviously, you know, the change, the framework will change and things have been changing much faster over the last two decades, especially over the last few months than we could have predicted. But at the same time, to be more impactful, you have to start from where we are at the moment. And this is the major part of the course. What is the reasons, the, gen the genesis of these issues? Why are they there and how can we sort them out? Um, the main case study that we'll focus on and we'll spend uh, anything between a third and a half of the course dealing with is the climate change. And climate change is a case study, first of all, because we cannot talk about everything. Secondly, because this is the area in which I am the expert and dealing, well, 50 hours a week, roughly. And thirdly, because this is a challenge and issue that will accelerate or worsen all the other issues, poverty, war, inequality, and so on and so forth, even pandemic. Um, so we'll deal with the climate change. I will explain this later on as well. The main objectives of the course, of the course um, are, first of all, provision of the information about the state of the world. Uh, what is the real state of the world, not the one that we would like to live in, or the one that we um, are suspecting we live in. So somehow we're trying to um, describe the reality much closer to a much more ob objective way. And each of us has a different perception of reality and we'll just try to find a common denominator. Um, another very important point is closely linked to that one. It's empowering you. It's empowering you as members of the most powerful generation in the history of the planet. And this is, um, there are many reasons why you are the most powerful generation in the history of the planet. I will explain this um, in, on one of the last slides. Also, another course, another goal of this course is to understand different perspective on the global problems and solutions. So what we are doing here is to get also your perspective. You are coming from different places. Uh, we had uh, many nationalities, many uh, different um, groups of people um, represented in the course, which is fascinating, which is giving us the advantage of learning not only in the classroom, but even more when you leave the classroom. Uh, when you study together, when you prepare for the exam, uh, when you um, prepare presentations and, and discuss and argue about the presentations. So these are all the elements when um, there is uh, quite some uh, potential for learning from each other. Why should you come to Berlin to study this uh, course? First of all, it's uh, a learning tool. Berlin is an amazing place to come, not only because of its, uh, well, many uh, historic values and uh, uh, great nightlife and also amazing weather in the summer, although um, it can also be surprising sometimes. Uh, but also because it's a place where the mo there are so many important think tanks based and uh, also numerous conferences and events take place. Not in July or August, but at least you have the possibility to get the connections uh, with the right people. So usually in August, especially um, the, the um, climate scene or everyone's going on holiday, to put it this way. So we will still have at least two excursions in the framework of the course. Uh, the first one will be to the place where I work, Climate Analytics. And the second one used to be to journalists uh, without borders uh, or reporters without borders in Berlin. Um, they hosted us already four times and hopefully they will uh, be able um, or find the time to host us again. So you will be given the opportunity to get first an expertise and networking opportunities 
also possibility to deepen the knowledge gained during the course when discussing, arguing uh, with other colleagues, with other, with my colleagues at Climate Analytics, but also um, some people at journalist uh, reporters without borders. Okay, um, today a few words about uh, the impact of the current crisis on the future, on your future. And uh, the title is The Impact of the Butterfly Effect. You may have seen the butterfly effect, the movie, uh, the movie from 2004 in which a 20, 20 year old student, Evan Trebon, travels back in time and um, inhabits his former self. And whenever he changes something in the past, things change radically in his current presence or in his future. Um, it's fascinating how small things that we trigger may have transformative change on the future. And uh, this is exactly where we are at the moment. Whatever we do now as society, as politicians, as policymakers, as students, as advisors will have huge impact on the future of our civilization, on your future as well. Um, the reason why this is the case is that we have a number of crises that merged at the same time. We have the climate crisis, which goes on. We have obviously pandemic crisis. We have social crisis. Those of you, especially from the US, but also from other parts of the world will know very well what I'm talking about. We do have uh, poverty crisis as well, because poverty will be accelerated uh, by the current crisis. Economic crisis is kind of like the major one that's currently discussed. So the question is, how do we deal with those crises? Because crisis is a time when the established ways of thinking are undermined and can be changed. And in most cases, the most barrier, the biggest barrier to change is exactly the established way of thinking. Therefore, whatever you do now will have huge impacts on the world we will living in in the coming decades. I would explain how it links also to you being the most powerful generation in the history at the end. The presentation aims at describing exactly the current framework and kind of like uh, equivalent to even Trevon reality. Why should you be careful about changing certain things and what repercussions may it have in the future as well? So um, you have to be careful. Contrary to Ivan Trebon, you will not be able to turn it back and to, uh, you know, to make it better next time. So it's the only chance we have to set things right. Um, why climate action matters? I will start with this one, uh, because obviously the repercussions of our action, um, I'm talking mainly about the, the repercussions of us taking or not taking action on climate change. Why climate change? Uh, first of all, the direct repercussions of climate change can already be felt. We have heat waves and flooding becoming more and more common. We have hurricanes strengthening, we have sea level rising. And uh, you've been witnessing some of those probably, depending on where you live, but I found the sea level rising kind of like the least um, extreme in the past when I was young and uneducated and not so educated of climate change. Now I find it the most impactful and obviously that's a subjective opinion because depending on where you live, um, you will be affected by different of those uh, aspects. And living in Berlin, I will not be affected by a sea level rise uh, probably in my lifetime. Um, not even hoping uh, to live so long, but the sea level rise is indeed, in my opinion, the most disastrous impact of climate change, especially because it's the most long lasting. So whatever we'll do now will have an impact for the next hundreds of generations. The, in 10,000 years, the CO2 that we emit currently will mostly be gone. It will return, if we're gone, uh, if, we, if we solve the issue of climate change, the CO2 emissions will slowly but steadily come back to the uh, usual level of, uh, of in around 200, 300 ppm. They are at 400, uh, 415 currently. The temperature increase will also, as a reaction to this, go, on to, the, go to the kind of level that we've been used to over the last 10,000 years. 100% of the sea level rise will be there. 
it uh, requires quite a lot of um, the, the the, the sea level or the, the, the water that's, that's accumulated due to the sea level rising um, just have to fall down somewhere where it stays as ice and as snow. And it will take tens of millennia before we do have, before we come back to uh, where we are currently. So this is for the sake of one generation. And uh, because what we, our in, the impact of, of, of our generation on the emissions is the major impact. We emit as much as we have never before. 2021 can be, uh, can be an exception from that. Emissions 2020 will decrease comparison to 2019, but they will go up again 2021. And we do still have huge emissions uh, annually. So this is the most scary aspect uh, from my perspective, but again, if you're living in a country in which, uh, which will be uninhabitable because of temperatures which will exceed anything that we can survive, the average increase in temperature is the average and uh, there will be much higher increase in certain parts of the world and um, temporary or permanent, um, then you will have different perspectives on that. I think I got the point, direct repercussions of climate change are disastrous and we have to do our best to avoid them. However, equally or even more disastrous are the indirect repercussions of climate change because what we are dealing with is um, society that uh, doesn't follow the rule of physics and doesn't act rationally in many cases. 2015 we had around 2 million refugees which came to Europe to escape war, to look for better lives. And uh, we ended up with almost splitting the European Union as a result of two million refugees. Just imagine what will happen if you have hundreds of millions of refugees standing in front of, uh, on, on the border with the US, on the border between Bangladesh and India, uh, uh, ready to enter Europe this way or the other. What choice do we have then? Do we let them stay there and uh, in many cases die? Or do we let them in and risk the threat of raising populism, nationalism, xenophobia that will obviously have an impact on other areas of policy? Usually xenophobia is coming together with trying to abolish the European Union because it's, again, it's exactly the opposite of what the EU stands for. So. Um, there is quite a lot of um, elements that may react to the physical repercussions of climate change or the kind of like the direct repercussions of climate change. Increased potential for war over limited resources. There will be less land, less water, less food for increasing population. Migration giving rise to populism. We had this before. We may have it on a much, much larger scale. Increasing inequality. Yes, you can adapt to climate change if you're very, very rich. Well, you can install more powerful air conditioning. You may uh, decide uh, to live in, in a country in which you don't even have to leave your car um, or your apartment or your um, air conditioned garage so, so that you don't actually you almost never go outside. Can we do it? Do we want to do it for eight, nine, 10 billion people? Some can, even if they don't want, if they don't want to, but uh, that's not really a livable um, opportunity. And if you own the land, if you own the food resources, if you own the water, you can make money on it. If you, want, if you own the weapon manufacturing companies, then obviously, keep in mind the increased potential for war, you will get richer and I don't think you should. Um, sadly, we would also deprive ourselves of the core benefits of climate action. The core benefits are the benefits which are not directly related to keeping te temperature at a level which is livable and which is the one that we got used to over the last 10,000 years and developed our civilization around. Um, so the cleaner air, 
is one of the major advantages, keeping in mind that between seven and eight million people die of air pollution every year around the world. Air pollution caused mainly by the, our habit of burning whatever we find. Energy dependence, um, many countries are uh, spending a lot of resources subsidizing richer countries uh, by purchasing their oil, gas, or coal. Job creation, renewable energy sources, energy efficiency, create many, many more jobs that will be lost in the fossil fuel industries. Especially important, those jobs will be created in areas where there are not many jobs currently. It's in rural areas, in areas where there is not much industry currently. So um, renewable energies and, and energy efficiency measures are the great equalizer. They create new middle class, they create new middle class, middle sized families, uh, uh, companies uh, run by families. So um, there is a huge co-benefit uh, or there are huge co-benefits of climate action. Also the fear from the future. Do we really care what the others think about? I think we should. Just uh, two comparisons. Imagine the duration of the 1914 standing on the street and celebrating that the war broke out. And most of those or many of those who were standing celebrating died uh, not very nice deaths uh, in the, in the, in the um, fighting a senseless war. So they didn't really know what they're doing and kind of like we may be surprised by, the, by their naive, naivety and some stupidity. Um, but whatever they've done doesn't have much impact on us currently or for your generation. Um, however, um, imagine another example. 19, late 1940s, 1950, Robert Schumann comes up with a crazy idea to, um, that, that Germans and, and French should give up their control over steel and, uh, steel and um, coal resources, manage it together and create the high authority. Uh, the high authority later create, became the European Commission and obviously the integration became the European Union, the most successful peace project of our times. And you know, just five years after the bloody war ended and they, they decided to work together with French, many French uh, were surprised. Uh, Germans were not, are not really um, uh, asked. It was a crazy idea and it was one which turned out to be the most powerful um, way to not let something like the Second World War happen ever again. So uh, which generation do we want to be? Do we want to be perceived as the stupid ones who had the opportunity, who had the tools, who knew what to do and did nothing? Or do we want to be the ones who shifted the trends and moved the whole world in a new direction, who allowed economic growth to continue because the reliance of fossil fuel is not the limit anymore and because the pollution is not um, countervailing whatever we win by more money. Um, so, well, my choice is clear. What about yours? Um, so this is why climate change matters and uh, climate action matters. And uh, this is why we should take action against climate change. And here are a few examples about the framework within which the, this, this, this will take place. Um, now, we are exactly in this butterfly moment. We are at the time when the history accelerates. So the COVID pandemic moved the world away from the path dependencies, from something which is not really the best solution, but is being related to or used because it's there. Just if you want to have an example of a path dependency, look at your keyboard. Uh, the QWERTY keyboard is not the most efficient way to write, but it was introduced because um, when you were using typewriters, you, didn't, you, you wanted to avoid pressing two buttons which were next to each other to, allow, uh, to, to avoid them stacking. Um, you know, obviously that's not an issue anymore, but uh, you have this path dependency in this case. And well, that's just too much, too many mental path dependencies. And in this case, you do not want to um, learn typing whenever you go to a different country and use different language or type in different language. So this path dependency is perfectly fine. In many cases, However, we have path dependencies, dependencies which do not make sense anymore. An example of that is sticking to coal. Some policymakers still associate coal with um, economic growth. Ignoring the impact that the, the discussion about economic growth and, uh, and the um, quality of life, also 
coal currently those days is the best way to slow down economic growth and to uh, waste a lot of resources um, on, on keeping in mind that there are many cheaper ways and that energy consumption is actually in some regards decreasing and uh, that we are doing great effort in integrating renewable sources of power in the power sector. So now we are at a time when the new, when the old path, path, path dependencies uh, will be abolished and are weakened. Some examples, global lockdown would have been unthinkable just weeks earlier. It was introduced, hopefully it will not have to be introduced anytime soon. Uh, However, policymakers just realized that they have to think outside of the box. Economy recovery packages was trillions agreed, not in person, but via teleconference. Amazing. Uh, not something like that would not have been possible just a while ago. And just imagine if these trillions are shifted, moving in the direction to develop renewable energy efficiency areas in which you create many more jobs instead of rescuing the old economy. Oil and coal industry are facing collapse. And, uh, you know, it's even in the US, where the US president tried to save a dying industry or said that he will save the coal mining jobs, um, the coal industry is collapsing faster than everyone ever predicted it would. So much more has changed, and uh, depending on where you live, you will have many other examples. And that would be the time when I would ask you. What did change in your country? Some other things didn't stay, uh, didn't change at all, actually. Global poverty is again on the rise, and international conflicts continue unabated, despite many more important issues that they should be dealing with. Climate change is still worsening, despite a temporary slowdown in emissions. So, keeping this in mind, that's an expensive opportunity. Expensive because we should have done it without, at the moment, over 500,000 people who died because of the COVID-19 and many, many other people got sick and, and have still um, repercussions of being sick. But it's there. So let's shift the trends. Let's use this crisis and solve the other crisis that didn't disappear, the climate crisis as well. What we can do, just some examples, clear understanding of what happens when we ignore science. You know, there were some policymakers, powerful people who said, well, there was no crisis, there is no pandemic. And uh, they had to change their minds as the hospitals were overwhelmed, as doctors had to choose between whom to rescue and whom not to. If you ignore science, you will pay a heavy price. It was always like that, that the pandemic helped us to realize that no matter how powerful you think you are, the loss of physics, biology that you just cannot change. And that applies to climate change as well. If you do not like consequences of climate change, it will not change it. Um, so that's uh, the repercussions of climate change will be there no matter if you like it or not. At the same time, we have an opportunity because in the crisis currently, renewables keep growing slower in some cases, but countries and policymakers realize that um, development of renewables is the best way out of the crisis. Another opportunity that will reduce emissions uh, and save us a lot of time would be working from home and digitization that create new opportunities for climate change mitigation and saving a lot of nerves of getting stuck in the traffic jam and will allow us to uh, use the time much more effectively and efficiently. Obviously, you should have many mobility opportunities and something like the lockdown should never happen again. But many of us didn't want to get stuck in a traffic jam, at least I wouldn't. Uh, so as a result, um, you know, maybe working from home will become standard and you will go to the office once in a while for important meeting or series of meetings which will significantly reduce emissions from transport. That's just some of the numerous opportunities that we are currently witnessing. Uh, in the EU, uh, two days ago, we had just uh, um, 
hydrogen strategy adopted that will also accelerate development in this regard. And uh, if, uh, uh, if it moves ahead, it will help us sort out the way uh, or the issues, how do we decarbonize other sectors of the economy as well. Now, um, the pillars of change. There are three main pillars that will instigate change later on. And I will describe each of them one by one. The first one are technologies. And uh, we do have a lot of progress on this side as well already. The Paris Agreement and the international negotiations this is another pillar of change that is uh, having a huge impact on um, the future development as well, keeping in mind the obligation for countries to do something about climate change and to report it back to the international community. And social movements, uh, which instigate change and uh, go uh, expand uh, between different, um, different, different uh, other pillars as well. Uh, they triggered action and uh, they are still there and now influencing the way we're getting out of the economic crisis. First of all, technological change. So the cost of renewables are de decreasing rapidly and it's uh, happening because the economies of scale result in wind and solar becoming cheaper source of energy in most parts of the world, which leads to the future cycle. The cheaper they are, the more governments decide to support them or even to allow them to develop that increases the market, the size of the market. And you may know the more of a product you produce, the cheaper the product gets because the, 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 the running costs um, or the, the fixed costs are stable, are usually not changing very much, divided by more units of a product results in lower price, which accelerates the amount of the size of the market for those products because on the increasing, increasing number of countries, these products are the cheapest ones. Uh, the cheaper source of energy. So this results in this accelerating cycles, cycle of decreasing price, increasing market for renewable sources of energy. The cost of, cost of energy storage decreasing as well. Uh, so we have many ways to store electricity. Uh, we can um, connect different um, parts of the grid, for example, to balance out the uh, variable character of uh, PV and wind. You can store energy in many, many different ways. Uh, batteries is just 1% out of uh, the storage for electricity, which um, hydro uh, pump uh, storage uh, being the most popular, but there are many other alternatives and price the main issue here. Um, you can also um, demand, ma demand, manage the demand for um, electricity demand so, um, so that whenever there is too much electricity, the price decreases, which encourages those who can, that's usually um, some companies, manufacturers, to consume the power, for example, to decrease the cooling um, units in the refrigerators, in the supermarkets, or whenever cooling is needed, and then decrease the demand for power when there is not much wind and not much sun. Um, we also have, um, hydrogen as another way to store energy, especially in the future. Currently, you should mainly use it to decarbonize the challenging sectors such as steel and um, uh, chemicals. When electricity decarbonizes, and electricity is around uh, a quarter of global emissions, uh, you um, should electrify as much as you can. Obviously, transport is one of the sectors where electrification is moving ahead. However, uh, you can also electrify other sectors. New modes of transport. Electrification is happening here rapidly, much faster than we um, could have predicted in the past, slower than needed to reach the Paris Agreement temperature limit. However, a lot is happening. Fast railways that can, uh, the short distance, replace aviation. Uh, we do have quite many examples of that ha happening in Germany, where you can travel from Berlin to Munich in less than four hours, which is kind of like a magic barrier. If it was less than four hours, you should take the train because taking the plane would take you equally long with going to the airport, waiting, flying, landing, going back to city center. By train, it gets you from the city center to the city center. Um, so fast railways can be a game changer here. The choice that we have, do we go for Hyperloop or do we just improve the infrastructure for millions, which is already there? You know, as much as I'm excited by Hyperloop, let's give a chance to something that does already exist and just accelerate, improve it. Um, 
you know, the, cha the choice may be, do you go for something which is expensive and for few, or do you improve something which is there, slightly cheaper, and for many, Hyperloop should be cheaper. Not quite sure about that. I think we should go both ways. The balance between those two ways is something that should be decided. Increasing the existing train, improving the existing train infrastructure or going in something completely new, completely different. Do not give up any of those options and the balance, how much money do we invest in each of those is um, to be decided. E-bikes uh, doesn't sound like game changer, but it is. Um, because that allows most of us to give up cars if we live in the city and uh, the public transport um, infrastructure is not very well developed in all countries. And sometimes you do not want to uh, or can't uh, cycle for 10, 20 kilometers, especially if you have a busy and very important meeting. But you, think you can take your electric bike and uh, get to work in this way because most of the distances we travel every day are less than 10 kilometers and uh, uh, only in a few cases uh, slightly more. So um, e-bikes could be the game changer, especially for short distance travels. Service economy, increasing the materialization of the economy. So we understood that we do not want a car. We want to get from A to B. And if you do it by uh, shared car, if you do it by bus, by, car, by, by uh, electric car or by, by electric bike, that's uh, secondary. It doesn't have to be your bike or it doesn't have to be your car. You know, I do like my bike and I wouldn't give it up. However, do you really have to have a car that costs you $8,000 a year? Uh, money that you can spend in a very different way. Um, especially if you're working from home most of the time. So that's, that's obviously different sets of opportunities that the mix of which you are, you will have to choose yourself. Digitization. Um, there was a point made recently that uh, the pandemic did more for digitization than all the plans and, and strategies developed by the countries and by uh, policymakers. Not quite sure that's the case, but uh, happy that we're moving forward. And uh, that, you know, as much as I would like to, I, I would like to have you in person, um, without digitization, you wouldn't be watching me at the moment, which you do because otherwise you wouldn't hear that. Um, so digitization, however, no doubt will still be traveling. And uh, the point is, if we travel, maybe we, we will not be traveled for a weekend to a country 5,000 kilometers away. Maybe if you really travel, if you have to fly, you go and stay there for a few weeks, a few months, and really immerse yourself in the um, society you're going to. So uh, see something else, not only the hotel and the, and the pool. So um, I am not worried about um, the potential negative impacts of decreased mobility in terms of, in, terms, in terms of flying to another country because you, know, you can travel to a country for a short period of time and not really understand how the society functions and how it is to live in that country. But if you're going there for a longer time, you're having this quality long-term holiday uh, or walking from holiday, uh, if it's not contra contradictory, um, then maybe uh, this will allow us to understand other societies even better. Moving towards services is a basic material needs are satisfied uh, is also another way to decrease emissions because uh, there's as much infrastructure and material things as you need at a certain point in time, all your needs are satisfied. What you need is services. Services that also include going to restaurant or to cinema as soon as possible. Uh, but you do not have to generate more emissions except for electricity, which will be decarbonized very soon, hopefully very soon anyway. So that's, that was the technological pillar. Now going into another pillar uh, that we would, we would spend quite some time digesting. Now, just quickly. You may have heard about the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, adopted in 1992, entered into force in 1994. The UNFCCC Convention, or the Convention, uh, 
is the most important uh, convention to deal with climate change and provide the framework for negotiations uh, within which we had a number of agreements. You may have heard of Kyoto uh, Protocol uh, adopted in 1997. In 2015, we had the Paris Agreement adopted. But let's go back again, Kyoto Protocol and uh, the failure of COP15 in Copenhagen. These were the lessons learned. This is something that we learned from and as a result, um, the Paris Agreement was born um, uh, in, in, in Paris in 2015. And uh, the main elements of this agreement include setting a limit on climate change. So the temperature increase should be um, limited to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and effort should be pursued to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 above pre-industrial levels. So um, just a very important point, two degrees is not the Paris Agreement temperature limit, it's well below two degrees. Uh, so that's um, if you're having uh, you know, a job uh, appointment uh, soon and someone asks about the Paris Agreement temperature limit, it's well below two degrees Celsius and preferably 1.5. And obviously 1.5 fulfills the criteria of well below two. So actually 1.5 is the limit, temperature limit of the Paris Agreement. Um, also, each country has to submit nationally determined contributions every, few, every five years. Uh, it should happen by the end of this year, by the way. The second wave of the NDCs, nationally determined contributions, should be submitted in, by 2020, which also includes 2020 itself. So a lot will be happening on this front as well. And uh, this is also a very important aspect because countries uh, have to develop the NDC. The NDC should represent the highest possible level of ambition to deal with climate change. And each of the subsequent NDCs should be more ambitious than the previous ones. And this is the way to make it clear what countries are doing to deal with climate change. And this is also a very powerful tool for so so civil society to instigate change and to drive um, transformation of the economy away from the fossil fuels. Also part of the Paris Agreement, um, it's the funding uh, financing for uh, developing countries uh, to support climate action in those countries uh, with 100, at least 100 billion annually and uh, adaptation and um, mitigation. So adapting to climate change, to the repercussions of climate change that are already happening and to mitigate climate change as well. And many of those countries do have the opportunity to actually skip the age of the fossil fuels and go straight to renewables. And uh, the global community should, and in some regards is supporting those, um, those developments. Now, the third pillar of change that I mentioned, social movements. So it's not, nothing really new. Social pressure has been there since the beginning of, uh, since uh, the issue of climate change reached the kind of public area. And uh, uh, there were many NGOs and organizations and individuals who were pointing out to the issue of climate change. However, what was also present was the climate change denialism and instigating doubt which allowed policymakers to continue business as usual, despite numerous studies, despite um, almost complete agreement about the reasons for climate change and lacking alternative explanation for what is happening, what is uh, being recorded, and there's no doubt that temperature, global average temperature is increasing. Um, so uh, still there were some people, industries saying, we're not sure Let's start with, let's do more research on that, which is obviously a way to slow down action and to waste more money on future, uh, on, on fossil fuels. The Fridays for Future movement was a game changer in this regard. Um, the Fridays for Future created many other sub movements or uh, co movements, scientists for future, teachers for future, parents for future, and so on, so, so, and, 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 and so on. And what they say is, just listen to the science. And uh, Greta Thunberg, whom you can see on the top picture, had a 
very short testimony in front of Congress a few months ago or a year ago, in which it has presented a 1.5 report by the IPCC, which reflects the position of the science on this. So what they say is, you know, this is what the scientists are saying, and your loss cannot win against the loss of physics. So guess which change, which laws have to change to avoid the worst of climate change. And, you know, there is no way to deny climate change anymore. Uh, it's uh, clearly visible that climate change is happening. And uh, still there are some of those who do hope that um, action can be postponed, more money on fossil fuels can be made. And uh, the current crisis is showing that it's not the case that fossil fuels is dying industry. And what we have to do is to save and help those who will lose the jobs and in some cases will lose the health insurance. Um, and uh, that's the notion behind the just transition or fair transition that uh, you know, we cannot allow for structural unemployment to take place in countries in regions affected by climate, uh, by um, uh, transformation away from fossil fuels. We have to help them move to new economy as well. We have to create new jobs where the jobs will be lost and in many other places as well. And this is where solar energy, where renewable energy, wind energy, energy efficiency measures, and many, many other measures are very well positioned to create those jobs. And we also can steer where the jobs will be created. Where are we now? So the Fridays for Future was transforming um, policies, influencing uh, the, the policy making process and then the crisis hit. Emissions collapsed, you can see this um, in the carbon monitor quite dramatically between January and April by around 7.5%, which is the deepest decrease um, recorded. However, the emissions collapse for wrong reasons. We do not want to stay home. We do not be under lockdown to save one crisis, uh, to save the climate change crisis. We want to have a good quality of life as well. And uh, we save the climate to have a better life. And uh, so what we have to do is to find out a way that will allow us to have a good life and uh, slow down and uh, by the middle of the century completely stop our emissions and our contribution to climate change and then after that after in the second half of the century take back some of those emissions to recuperate for the waste that we for the for the um, damage that we contributed to there was the fear that the economic crisis resulting from the COVID crisis uh, will uh, make the climate change mitigation issue problem falling to the bottom of the agenda and economic recovery uh, will be the priority. You know, just like 2008, 2009, when, you know, 2007 was the year in which a lot uh, has been said and started to be done about climate change, but uh, economic recovery was the top of the priorities in 2008, 2009 after economic crisis uh, or during the economic crisis. And it was to some degree in this regard, a lost crisis. We cannot do it again. And you know, this may change uh, as I'm speaking of uh, about it now in July, 2020, but uh, it seems like we've learned a lesson and the trillions are to to large degree, sadly not to not unanimously and not in all cases, but are to large degree flowing to climate mitigation, climate action. That's the case for uh, the EU, for example, where um, the green European Green Deal is perceived as a way to get out of the economic crisis as well, and sorting out two crises at the same time. And you know that's the most rational way to do it, uh, even if. Uh, should be complemented by the targeted fund for climate action um, because you're borrowing money from you from the future generations and you will pay it back and it would be very morally wrong if we 
borrow the money, borrowed the money from you to destroy the environment in which you will be living. So that would be really bad. So at least if we borrow money from you, we should do something that will, you know, improve your quality of life, or at least not worsen it significantly. Special report by the International Energy Agency and IMF uh, published in June concluded that we can get out of the crisis, create more jobs and lower emissions um, by sustainable recovery. So that's another message that we can get out of the crisis. However, the emissions are still increasing. The emissions um, concentration is still increasing. So it's not that we, that climate change took, took a break. We slowed down the emissions slightly this year, but we still emit much more than we had in many previous years. Next steps, where will we going? So we are at the crossroads currently and um, we can continue business as usual or instigate a radical change that will benefit future generations. So these are the two choices that we have. And the 2020s can be different from the 20, 1920s. You know, when the year began, it was quite some uh, worry about this being the year of the crisis or decade of the crisis, just like the 1920s. And indeed, it did begin um, with a crisis. But uh, we may make it very, very different. And it turns out that we learned on mistakes. You know, I mentioned these two generations, 1914 and 1940s or late 1940s. These two generations learned from each other, or the 1940s learned from the 1914 generation. The Paris Agreement was uh, built on some failures of the Kyoto Protocol, even if it was very successful, keeping in mind that it was negotiated within only three years and, and um, did reduce some emission, uh, did contribute to emissions reduction. And on the Copenhagen, which was also not a very successful uh, negotiation. So without failures, we wouldn't have successes. The economic recovery that's happening now is learning from the mistakes done in the 2008-2009 recovery. So uh, this allows me to believe that the 1920s, uh, the 2020s would be different than the 1920s. And there is a very nice statement written uh, by Alvin Toffler in his book, um, from 1980, the third wave. And it says that um, circumstances differ from uh, country to country, but never in history have there been so many reasonable educated people collectively armed with so incredible range of knowledge, never have so many enjoyed so high level of affluence. Precarious perhaps, yet ample enough to allow them time and energy for civic concern and action. Never have so many been able to travel, communicate, and to learn so much from other cultures and Above all, never have so many had so much to gain by guaranteeing that the necessary changes to profound be made peacefully. It can be complemented by saying that never had a generation so much to lose if they don't take the right position. Because we are the time of the butterfly effect, when the butterfly effect can kick in. Uh, you are the best educated guard generation with knowledge of the world in your pocket and you are the best network generation. Maybe at the moment you cannot really travel wherever you want to be, but this time will come again. And uh, hopefully you will use it to find out how we can work on certain challenges together. You are equipped with technologies needed to decarbonize our economies and uh, to improve the quality of life as well um, in many, many other ways to make the society more equal. You can also trigger action by your individual choices. You can start, start trends. There is an important point to that because, you know, most of us are followers. I am, many of you are as well. I mean, if you're not a follower, you're losing a lot of time because usually, we just follow certain rules in different areas of life. So when you go to a concert, you are trying to figure out what should I wear? You do not wear a suit to a rock concert. You do not really wear this, you know, uh, 
uh, short um, shorts to the to the opera hall. So you just follow trends established by others, and that's perfectly fine. But there are certain areas in which you can be the trendsetter. You can be the one who decides how others will behave without even them knowing that because they will just follow you as you do in many other areas. So uh, knowing that you trigger the trends, that you may be the first one who will say, I can live without a car. I will cycle to university or to work. I will not use plastic cups or I will not use plastic bags. Many, many, many other areas that can go beyond the environment, obviously. I will be the first one to take the, the, the vegetarian me meal this time. I don't want to be vegetarian, but this time I just like to try something different. You will see how many people will follow. Also, educate yourself to contribute to the numerous challenges in the rapidly changing world. This is how you can trigger change in the right direction. And you have to know what the repercussions of the action will be in the future. Because otherwise, you may also destroy quite a lot of uh, what has been achieved. So be smart about what needs to be done. Many members of the movement, of different movements, are emotional. They make it clear that they care about it, about something. But it doesn't really help in many cases. It is obviously the requirement to change things. But what is even more important is to be smart about what, is, what are the repercussions of your action. And last but not least, vote if you can. Some of you can't. Some of you would end up in prison if you try. Some of you watching this will probably um, try and try it and to have an impact on the policies in your countries in your cities and uh, it may not end up well. So those of you who have the right to vote and who do not risk anything by going and voting, well, what excuse would you have if you do not do that? Important, it's not only about national elections. Even more important are local regional elections that no one cares about. But this is where the action can happen. This is where you can have a new bike lane, where you can have charges for combustion cars ending your city center. This is where you can have fewer parking spaces for cars and more space for the community. So vote whenever you can, get involved in your community as well. Um, and uh, well, if you're old enough, candidate yourself. So that's all from my side. Um, if you have any questions um, regarding the content, uh, please let me know. I'm looking forward to discussion with you, hopefully in person one day, but if not, you have my email address here as well. That's my private email address. Um, whatever I said here is uh, only my opinion, not opinion of uh, phobies or climate analytics where I work. Um, so in case you would like to quote me, which I hope you don't, uh, quote me, not an organization that I work for. Important, if you have any questions regarding registering for FUBIs, or participating in, um, in the summer school next year, uh, do not contact me because uh, FUBIs team will know best how they can help you. And uh, they are the people. So what I would usually do is just forward them your email. So just send them an email directly. Thanks a lot for watching this far and have a great rest of the year. Hopefully see you in Berlin. Thank you.